Good afternoon, students and friends who are joining us on Facebook. We are delighted to have you with us here today for a question and answer session with Dr. Jack Hawkins, Jr., the Chancellor of Troy University. This Q&A event, which we are broadcasting on Facebook, is the conclusion of our first free summer leadership course. We've offered this course for the last four weeks. It began on June the 1st. We had about 1,600 students enroll, and we'll start a second cohort of this course on July the 1st. And I'll talk to you more uh, in a few minutes about how you can be a part of that. My name is Dr. Kerry Palmer. I'm the Associate Dean of the College of Education here at Troy, and I'm joined today by Dr. Jack Hawkins, Jr., who is the Chancellor of Troy University. Now, Dr. Hawkins has been Chancellor here at Troy since 1989. That makes him the longest serving chancellor or president of a public four-year institution in the nation. Prior to his appointment at Troy, Dr. Hawkins spent 10 years at the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind in Talladega. Before that, he was at UAB in Birmingham as an associate dean. He also served in the United States Marine Corps, saw combat, and led troops in Vietnam. Dr. Hawkins received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Montevallo and a PhD uh, from the University of Alabama. Dr. Hawkins, welcome and thank you for your time today. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Palmer. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And let me uh, congratulate all the students who have uh, had this experience with us in Leadership 101 and those who will uh, during the next month join us. And so it's a real privilege uh, for me to uh, have a small part in this whole program. Thank you. Yes, sir, and for our audience, we will be uh, taking questions from students uh, who are enrolled in the class, and we will do this again at the conclusion uh, of the July course as well. So our first question today, Dr. Hawkins, comes from Daniel Rosner, and Daniel asks, my question pertains to young people, especially those who do not see themselves as leaders or important enough to bring change. What words would you say to them? How would you explain to young people that they actually do hold the power to bring change? Uh, wonderful uh, question, Danielle, and, and, and thank you for uh, sharing that with me. I, uh, a number of thoughts come to mind. I, I, I particularly uh, think of what Mother Teresa uh, once admonished us to remember, and that is uh, everyone can do something. You know, leaders come and, and different versions and uh, I'm convinced too that leaders are uh, not necessarily born they are developed over time and uh, there may be uh, there may be essential ingredients uh, but over time you can develop leaders the military has been a great uh, training ground for uh, future leaders and as I think about how important it is uh, how we view ourselves uh, I believe strongly in a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, it's the old saying that most of us heard from our mothers, if you think you can't, you probably never will. But if you think you can, you probably will and can. I, I think uh, especially of, uh, of, of a personal experience that uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter had, uh, when she was in high school, and, and much to my surprise, she later told me that until she experienced the uh, Hugh O'Brien Leadership Program, uh, which is held annually, and uh, now it's conducted on the Troy University campus, and we're very proud of that, but then it was not, and she went away and spent several days uh, in the Hobie experience, and when she came home, uh, she shared with me that that really had changed her. And she said that for the very first time, someone had referred to her as a leader. You know, and I think that was, uh, I think that was step one in how she viewed herself. Later, she uh, matriculated uh, at the university and, and then became a commissioned officer in the United States Air Force. But it was that experience and seeing herself as a leader, I think, that changed her. All of us have that potential. And I think it's so, so critically important to recognize the more that our, our students can participate, all of us can participate in fulfilling leadership roles, 
whether it's uh, with a, uh, a small organization or uh, running a large corporation, you know, they're essential, uh, they're essential ingredients in leadership, but it can be taught, and those things can be taught. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Our second question today comes from Jeff Bowler, and Jeff asks, how can aspiring leaders learn how to honor their vision while also handling doubt when the going gets tough? <laughs> oh, wonderful question. I think all of us doubt ourselves probably more than we should. Uh, you know, in, in, it, in its natural doubt and self-doubt, that's, that's a very natural uh, inclination. I think, though, uh, one has to recognize that if you're batting a thousand in decision making, it's like uh, it's hitting a softball and, and not a baseball. None of us will make uh, all the right decisions. Now, in a leadership role, you'd best uh, hit better than 500. <laughs> and, uh, but it goes, it goes without saying that uh, the opportunity to fail offers an opportunity to succeed. And therein, I think, is the, is the key. And that is a foundation. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the foundation for good leaders is uh, a good, strong moral compass. And if you stand on a rock and you know what your values include and, and you follow that moral compass, then the azimuth that accompanies that moral compass, compass in, in terms of direction uh, will be true to course. Uh, I, I believe in cataclysmic evolution, but I don't believe that a vision is some, it occurs with an epiphany most often. I think a shared thoughtful process is really what, uh, what contributes to a vision that can be realized. I know when we came to uh, Troy, and you mentioned uh, in the summer of 1989, uh, we were encouraged to have an investiture immediately, but we chose not to do that. We wanted to spend at least a year talking about and framing the problems that we needed to address. We uh, had a cons consultative team in, in support of that. They uh, interviewed everyone from the governor to the president of our SGA, and, and we knew fairly well what the major problems that uh, had to be framed included. Uh, it was from there that we were able to draw a lot of conclusions. In fact, uh, 13 months later, when we had that investiture, it gave me a, a solid foundation upon which to make some declarations. One, uh, within a decade, we would no longer be just a regional university. We would be international in scope. Uh, within a decade, we would look to uh, how, to, how to get more out of the investment. Ultimately, that led to the reinvention of the entire university and a Troy University, which previously had been three independently accredited campuses. But that vision took time. And when we, when we finally declared what our vision included, we knew that it was, uh, it, it's, it was solid. And, uh, and while you'll always doubt, I would so draw the analogy it's almost akin to an ocean voyage. If you see that lighthouse, uh, you recognize that changing seas, weather conditions may re require that and dictate that you, your path changes, but ultimately your goal remains the same. And, uh, and I, I guess I would conclude by saying I love the, the story of Walt Disney and his vision. It was in 1957 that my family uh, journeyed out to Disneyland and that was two years after it opened and I found that just exhilarating and uh, I was thrilled a, a few years later when uh, Walt Disney in 1964 announced the groundbreaking for Disney World in uh, Orlando. Unfortunately Walt Disney passed away two years later in 1966. However, in 1971, at the ribbon cutting, his niece walked up to his brother Roy, who was presiding at that uh, ceremony, and she said, I wish Uncle Walt could see this. To which Roy Disney said, Uncle Walt did see this, and that's why we are here today. Uh, a vision, uh, a vision shared with a lot of shareholders uh, can, can really become reality 
uh, recognizing that sometimes that path leading to that goal uh, may have to be altered. I well remember that 1990 <laughs> inauguration. I was a freshman. It's been fascinating to come back all these years later and see so much of what we talked about, what we heard, come to fruition. Our next question comes from Su uh, Susan Hornsby. And Susan asks a detailed question here. The past few months have brought unprecedented change to our world in many areas, in educational issues, social issues, health issues, and more. Could you speak specifically about the role and importance of flexibility as it pertains to leadership in times of uncertainty? And also, with that in mind, what constants have you drawn upon to help navigate these times? Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, no doubt uh, these have been some of the most uh, tumultuous times that any of us have experienced. I know uh, we're, we're seeing develop uh, new paradigms that will never uh, reverse to what we were. You know, I'm seeing uh, really uh, even in education, K through 12 and higher education, uh, where we were once uh, literally all high touch that's been transformed. I think uh, it'll be the long-term answer will be a combination, the blended between high touch and high tech. And, and, and I, I, so I, I really appreciate, appreciate that question. And I guess as you go through life uh, and you, you realize the importance of flexibility, uh, I can draw an analogy here with uh, a, a playback for a football team. Uh, on a chart or on the board when the coach puts those X's and O's there, it's a pretty sterile situation. Uh, and it's quite easy to see how you can lead to yourself to success. But when the ball is snapped, that's when real change occurs and that's when flexibility is dictated. Uh, you may have to hit that line like that running back and then you have to find another hole. And that's, uh, that's what we're going through today. I think uh, we have to maintain flexibility in a leadership role. <clears throat> I think that flexibility has uh, an underpinning of, uh, of uh, principles that you're willing to, to uh, live with and, and, and endorse and recognizing too that uh, the reed that bends doesn't break. You know, but you can't compromise principle, but you have to be flexible. And I think within that, uh, you recognize that uh, there are truisms in life, uh, but most of the time there is flexibility uh, in, even within those truisms. Uh, and, and, I, and, that, and what I described in terms of a football playback would certainly be true in other environments. I know we have a lot of military personnel who are taking this course, and they know well how clean it is and sterile when you study, for example, in infantry tactics, it can be easily accomplished, but it's when that first round goes off that changes begin and flexibility has to be part of it, but you cannot compromise your basic principles. Uh, that has to, you have to be true to, to, to yourself and to those fundamental uh, beliefs that, uh, that you have. Excellent. Our next question comes from Rachel Conrad, Rachel asks, which of your mentors do you closely mimic in your speech and who are you most like? <laughs> oh, that's a powerful question. I guess, you know, uh, what I would say to all of our students, and, and certainly this is, is predicated on my own experience, there's hardly anything more valuable than a mentor that uh, is committed to you. And, uh, and when you go through life and you can reflect and, and see that you've had, you know, five or six mentors that really opened doors for you, guided you, uh, served as a good example, uh, I think a, a mentor is priceless, you know, and, and I can look back on my own experiences and, and see some of my most valuable mentors uh, in, in higher education, you know, occurred almost 50 years ago. Uh, I, for example, I was very, very fortunate to be at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, two years after it was declared a university. Prior to that time, it was a medical center. 
And I can remember lessons that I, that I gleaned from uh, some of those people. I don't know that they ever knew that they were my mentor. I think most of them did. And I had uh, three there. The first president of the University of Alabama, Birmingham, Dr. Joe Volker, was a brilliant man. Every opportunity I had to, uh, to draw from him, I, I would draw from him. One day, several of us had an opportunity to encourage him to allow us to uh, design or to draw up an organizational chart. I, I guess my military experience had led me to believe that everything needs to be in boxes. And Dr. Volker uh, introduced me to a, a new idea. He said, no, he said, we're a new university. What we want to do is to hire the very best and brightest we can hire. Uh, we want to turn them loose. And he said our biggest challenge, and he was right, he said our biggest challenge is going to be the human tendency to want to micromanage the affairs of those people that, uh, that we're privileged to lead. He said, but we have to refrain from doing that because good people left to their own devices and when their creative juices are allowed to flow, they will go out and do great things. And he said, and then when they've created those centers of excellence, we'll come back and draw those boxes around those centers. For me, that was a new paradigm. And I, I think I've, I extracted from that the importance of uh, mentorship, the importance of, uh, of empowering people. The bottom line for that example, over the last half century, uh, year in and year out, UAB has been one of the, the highest ranked medical centers in America. I attribute a lot of that to the belief in people, the trust in people, that the original leadership of that medical center and that university demonstrated. You know, so a mentor, when you have an opportunity to have a mentor, grab hold of that opportunity. Sit at the mentor's feet. In time, all of us who benefited from a mentor will have a responsibility to serve as a mentor. And mentors in today's world, they're critical. And I guess I would say that what's most important, though, is not so much the advice we give, but the example we provide. And I love the comment by St. Francis of Assisi, who said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. You know, in life, it's not what we say, it's what we do. And now, real leadership occurs when the walk and the talk intersect, and that's what all of us should strive to demonstrate. Excellent advice. Now, our next question comes from Lori Basham. Lori's a 1988 Troy graduate. She also has both sons. Both of her sons are Troy Trojans. Her youngest son is a senior this year, and her other son graduated from Troy in 2018. So this <clears throat> is a Trojan family right. through and through. Her question, Lori's question, right. is also very pertinent to today. How has social media changed the way leaders <laughs> and the university as a whole do business? <laughs> uh, I think Lori probably knew the answer to that question when she asked it because uh, uh, all of us, I think, recognize that uh, discretion is the better part of valor. Uh, and what I would encourage uh, all of us to remember is that uh, words unspoken or unwritten never have to be re re retracted or uh, asked or forgiveness given. You know, so discretion is so important. Uh, in the use of social media, uh, this is a new era. I mean, uh, and today, what we do this instant can be can have a ripple effect, and we're seeing it almost daily in the in the examples of uh, indiscretion that we that we witness. Uh, but I think it's so important that uh, that we recognize too, as we deal with social media, that there is in leadership, in my opinion, uh, a, a truism. And that is familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, it's probably uh, better demonstrated in the practices in the military, for example, where, where you have a separation of powers. And, and, uh, but it's generally recognized that familiarity does breed contempt. I think the, uh, the story that I could share that might uh, make that, uh, that, that example more clear 
Uh, I love the story of St. Simone, the 14th century evangelical. And he uh, climbed atop a 60-foot tower. And for 20 years, he preached. He uh, evangelized. And many thousands of people came from many miles away to hear St. Simone. And when he came off the platform after being there for 20 years, he was asked by what probably was the 14th century equivalent of a roving reporter, uh, what was the most difficult part of that experience? To which St. Simone said, getting on the platform. You know, I think that speaks volumes about the importance of separation and leadership. All of us want to be just one of the clan but a leader generally has to step just beyond that point. And if you ever compromise that leadership platform, it's very, very difficult to get back on that platform. You know, so I, I would say social media is a great tool used properly. Discretion is a key, uh, but avoid familiarity if you're in a leadership role. Wise advice. Uh, we have another question from Lori also. <laughs> How has your leadership or your leadership style changed since you came to Troy in the late 1980s? Gosh, uh, you know, you, it, 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 life is a catch-22. You know, you need experience, but you have to live in order to get experience, right? Uh, none of us, I don't think, monopolize all the answers we need either early or later in life. I, I think uh, what you learn going through life, though, especially in a, a leadership role and in today's environment more than ever before, and that is the importance of, uh, of interaction, the importance of collaboration, the importance of teamwork. Uh, none of us, uh, none of us uh, uh, have all those answers. And as you go through life too, especially as I look back over these years at Troy, uh, you learn that nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. You know, patience is important. Looking at things over a longer period of time as opposed to what might be the, 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 the immediate results in front of you. Uh, easy decisions can be easily evaluated. Difficult decisions take more time. And it's those complex issues that we have to deal with on a regular basis that may take a little more time. You've got to work with people. You've got to believe in teamwork. You've got to recognize the importance that the various team members play, uh, but I think uh, I think uh, wisdom over time uh, is what all of us strive to achieve. Uh, you got to feed your strengths, you got to starve your weaknesses, you got to avoid micromanagement, and you got to be patient. Hmm. One more from Lori. <laughs> How has the instant gratification world in which we live added to the challenges? A leader is expected to face. Uh, that may be a. That may be simply responded to, and uh, and maybe I've responded to this earlier in in my first message to the students, uh, but I keep going back to the value of what President Reagan said, and when he he encouraged us to remember that if it feels good, don't do it. I think, uh, I think that is, uh, is wisdom that needs to be imparted to all of us. If it feels good, that immediate reaction uh, and that instant gratification may not be long-lasting. Oh, absolutely. We have a couple of questions here from uh, incoming freshman to Troy, Kate Carroll. Uh, the first of her questions, as a leader for many years, if there was one thing you could have done differently, what would it be? Uh -huh. Uh, let me go back 40 years. Uh, not, this is well before Troy. You know, I, I've been I've been fortunate to uh, uh, to be in several administrative roles over time. I'm not sure that as a younger man that I had as much confidence in subordinates as uh, they deserved. And as I look back over, you know, the role of leadership and leaders. I, I see the importance, too, of growing those leaders who look to you. Uh, development of leadership is important. And, and integral to that, I think, uh, is the element of trust. Now, trust 
is important in a, within a leadership team. Trust is integral uh, to loyalty. Loyalty is never given away. Trust is never given away. All of that is earned, and it's earned over a period of time, and it's earned through consistency, and it's earned through uh, commitment to excellence. But one thing I think that, uh, that I've learned over these years is that to really realize that people have strengths, but all of us have weaknesses. And in a leadership role, I think uh, we have to view our people in the same way that we would view that glass. It's half full, not half empty. And so we have to give our people the benefit of the doubt. As a younger man, I'm not sure that, uh, that I delegated sufficiently, and delegation is an art. Uh, and I'm not sure that I really had the trust that many of those subordinates deserved. Uh, and so I, I think uh, what, I would, what I would do differently would be uh, in, in the art of delegation, depending on others, give them an opportunity to fail because inherent is an opportunity to succeed. Let's, let's not fail people before, prematurely. Uh, also from Kate, how have you dealt with biases <laughs> in your leadership roles and has it been uncomfortable for you to do so at times? Wonderful, uh, wonderful question, uh, especially in today's environment. I can't think of a more appropriate question given what we're experiencing across this country, and, and it does appear to be chaotic at this point. I think a lot of good can come from the conversation that's being generated today. I, I think about, uh, as I reflect upon that question, I think about my own past, you know, uh, it's been a really a remarkable journey to go from uh, childhood and, and uh, a period when I never went to an integrated school. I never went to uh, an integrated college until I later did a PhD. But I went through an entire K through 12 undergraduate master's program without experiencing integration. Uh, my first introduction, and I even was commissioned a lieutenant in the Marine Corps, uh, and there was not one African American in my entire company. And so my first introduction to an integrated community was when I became a platoon leader in Vietnam, and about 25% of my Marines were African American or Hispanic. Or, yeah. But what Ben Carson, a noted brain surgeon, and who ran for president and came out of the projects of Detroit. What a great example of success. You know, he became a, a, a worldwide and a, and, a, and a known brain surgeon at Johns Hopkins. And uh, he made the comment, uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting him and actually introducing him quite a number of years ago. He's a remarkable man. He said this, he had, he had uh, done brain surgery on people from all over the world, different colors, different races, different cultures, and he made this comment. He said, but what I have learned is all blood flows red. And he was exactly right. You know, that's what's important to remember. And I think as I went through the military and then I had the pleasure too of working with uh, uh, what some people would refer to as the disabled, we thought, they were inconvenienced more than disabled because we didn't focus at the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind on the disability. We focused on the ability. And what you learn over time is that people are the same. They may have different challenges before them. Uh, and I think in today's world, what we have to do is to give each other the benefit of the doubt. But I am convinced as we've attempted to create an international community at Troy University so that we could graduate globally competitive students. Our focus has not been on the differences. Our focus, I hope, and I believe this to be true, has been on the understanding because it's through understanding that you learn to appreciate. And it's in an environment like we've created at Troy where people from 80 different countries come together and learn to work together and play together and to love each other and to care about each other, that's, I think, the future. And that's why the importance of, of learning how to work with each other is so, so critically important. 
and today I think we have a, a great uh, a great opportunity to do that. Indeed. Uh, Gene Nearman represents so much of what we've seen in this class and that students who are from far outside the borders of Alabama. She's training content developer and a trainer uh, for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Service. Uh, and she asks, Gene asks, I would like for you to discuss how you handle a situation when things go south. <laughs> That's a great question and I, and I appreciate the I appreciate the question and appreciate Jean's involvement in this, this program and, and I, I wish her well, so thank you. Uh, I guess my first reaction is uh, as I think about a team and the answer to what she's, what the question addresses is I think found in, in, in that response. But I try never to hire anyone who's not smarter than I am and that's pretty easy for some of us to do, you know, <laughs> because there's so many bright people walking around with so much to contribute. But everybody has to bring something to the table. Now, here is what we do as a leadership team at Troy University. And I did this the same uh, in previous uh, roles. The first thing that we do when things appear to be going south is to convene the team. And the first step in solving a problem is to frame the problem. It's too often we try to solve the problem before we understand the problem. And uh, generally all that does is to create the illusion of progress and it not the solution that may be required. And then you develop uh, your plan to based on your best solution. And, and you recognize that things are not irreversible. You know, if, you're, if your mission was clear and if your plan was well designed at the outset, maybe it's just a way of uh, redirecting, going back to that, uh, that, that ocean voyage that I described earlier. We have to be flexible, we have to learn to adjust, have to learn to trust others, rely on that team. That's why you bring people with different talents and skill sets and, and, and never hire. And I've seen some, I've seen some executives do this. Never hire yes people. Never hire people that are just going to simply feed your ego. Hire people that can bring something to the table, and then do what most of us don't do very well: listen to that input. If you do that, even if you're going south, you can turn it around and go north again. Mm, excellent. Last question, also from Gene. How are you successful when you have to have a tough conversation with someone? <laughs> you know, I think if it weren't for personnel issues, leadership would be easy. <laughs> uh, but this is a human business. And, uh, and at the heart of most problems you find, especially in those difficult employee situations, you find attitude more than anything else. I try to encourage all of our students to remember that 90% of the people in this country, and research bears this out, who lose their job each year. They don't lose their job because they can't do their job. They lose their job because of a bad attitude. And if a bad attitude will get you fired, which it will, a good attitude will get you promoted and hired and promoted. You know, and so I think probably the most difficult thing that any of us have to do is to have those hard conversations I would be quick to say, though, never have those hard conversations in public. You know, conversations that, uh, that where candor is required and, and criticism. And, and don't err on the side of being critical. Err on the side of being constructively critical. Uh, because it's all our response. I think it's our responsibility and leadership role to grow up. To grow up. And, I think I pointed out, I, I love what Coach Brian, he would always uh, uh, take the blame and give the credit, you know. And I would say to uh, our students and to those studying here and, and others who are professionals uh, who already know this, uh, you know, credit in public and, and uh, critique in private. Uh, but it'll be those tough discussions. And it's generally only to about five to maybe 5% of the, the people. So 90, 95% of the people work hard. They want to do the right thing. They deserve praise and not criticism. But when the, when the going gets tough, 
uh, recognize it's not about being critical. It's about being helpful. Generally, if people understand and can frame their shortcomings, I'm convinced that most people uh, uh, will do the right thing. They want to do the right thing. Often, they just don't know what the right thing is. And so don't be, uh, don't be reluctant, but do it in a constructive way. Thank you so much for the answer to that question. Thank you for the answer to all of these questions and for taking the time today uh, to participate in this. And for those of you that are joining us on this Facebook broadcast, thank you. Uh, for our students, thank you for being a part of this class in June. You have been fantastic. We've enjoyed interacting with you uh, in our discussion forums. I hope that you've gotten a great deal out of the course and out of this broadcast today. Uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, we have another section of LDR 101, Introduction to Leadership, that's starting on July 1st, and you can be a part of that. Uh, enrollment is still open. You just simply need to go to troy.edu slash leadership, troy.edu slash leadership. You can also email us at leadership at troy.edu. Thank you again for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you with us.